Well, with testing ideas, one of the things that I've run into, and I'm not sure if you all have run into this or not, is that from time to time, ideas don't work. They feel flat on your, your, your face, right? <laughs> and, and I've experienced that multiple times. But I think what's really important for us is not to get scared by the idea of falling or failing, but realize that every time we fall or fail, quote, quote unquote, it's really a learning experience. It's really an opportunity for us to say, hey, wow, that theoretically sounded like a wonderful idea. But when we tried it and we tested it, we quickly realized that's actually not going to work. But instead of pouting, instead of getting discouraged, instead of getting frustrated, I think the posture that we want to encourage everyone here to have is really use it as an opportunity to learn and to grow. I don't know about you all, but one of the best ways that I learn, and maybe it's just because I'm stubborn or, or, or <laughs> dense, I don't know. My wife definitely tells me I'm a little stubborn and dense. Um, but one of the ways I learn is I kind of have to try it and, and kind of fail. I still remember as a kid, my mom told me not to touch the hot plate of a coffee pot. She told me multiple times, guess what I did? I still touched it. And then I realized, oh, that's why you're not supposed to touch. Mm -hmm. But my failure enabled me to learn. And this is still true as I lead my community, and I know this is true of so many of us as we lead our communities. Let's not let failure discourage us, but really use it as an opportunity to fall forward and to learn and reframe it as a great, great learning opportunity. One of the key reasons we are finding some new worshiping communities hit a plateau and just stay there is that they do have a difficulty owning the fact that something's not working and then backing away from it or pivoting. And there's a lot of great reasons why it is hard to say something's not working. I mean, one of them is, is we know we had a great idea or we think we did and we kind of dig in and roll up our sleeves and want to work harder. Another possibility is that we don't want to look at the data and take a realistic read of what's happening. Um, that can be a really hard, threatening sort of thing to do, especially when we feel like we need to present with success, right? We feel a need to present our community with an angle towards success so that we have more people join our community, so that we can find the leaders, so that we can find the funders we need. There's a difficulty sometimes determining what's not working. I mean, if you've tried something, it probably is working for at least some people. And it probably is really having some meaning and some impact for their lives. How do you say, in keeping with your own principles and convictions, in keeping with the resistance to getting caught in a numbers game, how do you say we actually need to do something different, we need to pivot, even when it still means something to a few people? How do you determine that something is not yielding the fruit that is needed? These are hard calls to make. And taking an unflinching look at what we're doing, why, and the question of whether we need to pivot is hard. But I also think part of it is because we think of failure as in pretty simplistic kind of old school definitions that make it the opposite of success. When in fact, failure is part of success. Failure is a complement to success. There's not going to be success without a lot of different try, fail, try, that didn't work, pivot. Thomas Edison once famously said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. So now there's a recent surge in the willingness to pay attention to trying things. And if they don't work, having that be a part of, an essential part of, the run-up to finding what will work, what is the right rhythm, what is the right groove, what is the right path. And there is a tremendous amount of need for leadership that does not see failure as the end-all, be-all, as a defining characteristic, as something to be run away from and said, oh, no, we didn't fail, but instead to see it as a complement to success, a part of the overall fabric of just what's going to happen as we try and as we live into 
the newness that God is bringing. I really do agree 100% with what Lindsay just shared. I think we really need to reframe our understanding of failure, falling. It's okay. It's actually good. You learn from it. It's our, vital to creativity. Sorry. It's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> vital to creativity. Uh, if we aren't failing, then we aren't going to create because everything is, is good and you maintain the status quo. I know this is true of our community at Four Points. Uh, we've failed in so many ways. We've lost count. It's part of our culture, actually. It's part of something that we actually embrace. I encourage it. One of the things that I say to our staff and our community leaders is that, hey, it's okay to fail. I want you to fail. Maybe not fail at the same thing, doing it the same way over and over and over again. That's a completely different story. But if you're trying different things, being creative and trying to, to complete and fulfill the why and the mission and the vision of the community, and it doesn't work, that's okay. I think it's a wonderful way to learn. I know that's true for us on a macro level. When we first started our community, we, we were targeting young adults, for lack of a better term, and we thought that, hey, you know what, young adults, they probably have a long, late Saturday night, so maybe Sunday morning worship service wouldn't be the ideal time for them. So we actually started intentionally meeting in the late afternoons, four or five o'clock in this on Sunday afternoons, thinking that, hey, for a lot of single adults, this might actually work better because they can sleep in a little bit, uh, maybe get over their hangover a little bit, whatever it may be, and then they'll be ready to come and worship at four or five o'clock with us. Some people it worked, to your point. For some people it worked, but what we quickly found out was that for the vast majority, it was still not a good time. They would rather come Sunday morning versus Sunday late afternoon because some of them, in fact, the vast majority of them are working, so they need to get ready for the next day, whether they were school teachers or business travelers. Late Sunday just wasn't going to work for them. So we went back to our why. Well, why are we existing? Well, we want to create a spiritual home for these people. Well, if the 4 or 5 p.m. isn't working for them, we need to pivot, and that's okay. And so... That's kind of part of our DNA. And that's part of our culture. Where we've embraced it. We're not perfect at it. We feel we fail at failing. <laughs> we truly do fail at failing from time to time. But we embrace it. We welcome it because it's an opportunity for us to learn, to grow, and as Lindsay said, to be creative. And I think it's something that all worshiping communities, if we can reframe that and switch our mental models about what it is, it's going to be so life-giving. Mm -hmm. As we think about failure in our community, uh, I think one of the ways that we have gotten ourselves in trouble a couple times is that we are both activators and can tend to get excited about something and move forward with something before there's enough clarity on the front end. Two quick examples. I think early on we were collaborating a lot more with the gym owners of the gym that we were at, but there wasn't as much clarity um, distinguishing our roles. And so I think there was some probably unnecessary conflict that we faced um, in making some decisions around integration of our worship gathering and their gym um, that could have been cleared up if we had clarified um, our roles um, a little bit more. Another place the same issue affected what we did was we were using a particular gym um, for our gatherings. This was a different gym in, in the area and um, one of the coaches let us use our space and we were grateful for it. Um, again, we probably didn't provide enough clarity about what we were doing and we also didn't have enough conversation with the owner of the space. So when the owner caught wind of what we were doing, he pretty abruptly told us we couldn't use their space anymore. So we had to go find another gym to be a part of. Um, and so I think for us, our, our tendency is to do and to act and to jump in. And we need to continue at times to probably slow ourselves down and bring clarity to the situation, both for us and those that we're working with, so that everyone's uh, fully bought in and, and people know kind of their roles and expectations. Campus ministry, that is the field of failures of ministry. So I'm not, I, I don't want to say that's the characteristic or, you know, some, you know, 
features of that ministry. But I had a hard time with the students. So not that all students, but the campus ministry is very small and then the lack of leadership, lack of program, a lack of you know, system. The students who want to who want to belong to more bigger campus ministry or other church context. So once they you know, participate in or had a chance to join other campus ministry or other church local churches, they just disappeared without any notice. So I know it, for them it was hard to say buy something or just leave the message. But you know, personally, you know, it hurt me because you know I just you know blame myself and then I I thought uh, what, what 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 am I supposed to do in my ministry or what was I supposed to do to have them in my ministry and sometimes the campus ministry other campus ministry my students join and the, the pastor I already knew, know him and then we know each other and then we just encounter on the campus or just we had a meeting together and then we never mention about that student so that's that's not anybody's fault but you know just this connection or this disappear of students that 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 is the huge fail in my ministry and in my emotion so it, it was very it very discouraged me and discouraged my ministry but that that is a campus ministry so i i cannot claim oh this is my ship right so she or he is the the children of god not mine so i just you know, learned through that so that is the most common failure in my ministry AI Jcast's story is bound up in the story of failure. It only exists because of failure. When I first started looking into this, I knew that I had this deep hunger to connect with artists. And as somebody who had spent a couple decades working in professional traditional church ministry, I thought it meant gathering people, artists into a space, creating church for each other. And it may have looked non-traditional, but it was really kind of that traditional model of community. And so I began just connecting with everyone I knew who was an artist or who knew artists and then relied on them to connect me with other folks and was having a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations about art, about faith, about the urgent issues of justice, whether it be racial injustice and inequity in America or LGBTQIA inclusion, exclusion within the church, uh, the role of women in society and toxic masculinity. So we were having these incredible conversations and how art was pulling me into these conversations with these artists. And then I said, oh great, we'll just get everybody together. And they didn't come. And I think there are a couple reasons for that. Some of them my own lack of ability to draw them together. Some of it having to do with artists having these very full bandwidth already. And so the inability to carve out more time in order to do this was just not feasible. And yet I recognize something powerful in these one-on-one -on -one conversations, a willingness to engage a deep connection and intimate connection with folk in these conversations. And the fact that I was being transformed by them and I also had the technology at my disposal, having done just sermon podcasting before, having worked in the audio production world before. There was a learning curve, but it reminded me that I was able to bring those gifts, a fullness of myself into this, and basically to create a virtual space where if I couldn't get them in the same room, they could eavesdrop on these conversations with one another and have these experiences in a more indirect way. And through our partnerships, we have been able to bring them together in very direct ways, which has been really powerful and affirming. So yeah, so it started out to be a traditional church and then because of failure ended up being this very different model. 
I think the other thing that occurs to me about AIJCast is the ability to iterate and experiment and change, drawing on a lot of the Eric Reese work done in Lean Startup, which is a very quick read. And this notion of not trying to build something giant that then can succeed or fail, but to try something small, measuring whether it succeeds or not, and then seeing if you can build that into something bigger, making it viable, and then going into flourishing. So the idea of purchasing some equipment, and it wasn't a whole lot, it wasn't a great expense to purchase that equipment, to carve out the time to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations and then to use the internet as the platform for sharing these conversations. That was an easy, quick experiment that could then be built into something bigger and bigger. And the audience has been there. The audience has been there from day one. It has grown over and over and over and over again which means that we have something that we can keep building on. And we continue to experiment. We continue to try new things. Some of them work, some of them don't. We learn from them, and in the words of the Lean Startup, we fail forward. I was in college when I learned how to downhill ski, and my father-in-law actually taught me. He wasn't my father-in-law then, he was the dad of the guy I was dating, but he was ski patrol for a long period of his life in Colorado, and he was an amazing skier. In fact, the whole family was, and whenever they would ski, people would actually stop them and say, hey, are you all related? Because they had the same style. So as I'm tumbling down the steep mountains of Colorado behind them, one thing my father-in-law said to me over and over and over again is, if you're not falling down, you're not trying hard enough. I feel like that's the way it is with new worshiping communities. We try some stuff, and if we're never failing, we may need to step up our creativity game and be willing to try a wider range of things, all for the glory of God. Friends, this is Module 1 of Thrive. So go now, doing the discernment work needed to start with a compelling, clear why. Go from this time, testing ideas, co-creating them, and starting small, until you know it's time to go big. Go, reframing failure as learning and giving thanks to God for failure's gifts. And may the Creator God, in whose image you have been made, bless you, keep you, and remind you always that you are an able partner in the ongoing work of creation.